Bruce Partridge, Emeritus Professor of Astronomy in the Science Department at Haverford College, is a true pioneer and hero in the study of the cosmic microwave background. He's one of the OGs. But it sure helped establish the cosmic nature of the radiation that Enzius and Wilson found. He was involved in the first measurements of the CMB spectrum to confirm its true cosmic origin. That result decimated the steady state theory. He was also one of the first scientists to look for the small scale temperature fluctuations, which provided us with detailed insights into the distribution of matter in the early universe. He's made major contributions in both theory and experiment, helping us understand the cosmos, turning cosmology into a precision science. Join us for an exciting episode as we explore the early universe. Welcome everybody to another exciting episode of the Into the Impossible podcast featuring a friend, a colleague, a collaborator, and most importantly, a mentor in the space of education and of my field, cosmologists, generations of them. And that's Bruce Partridge, who's an emeritus professor at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. How are you today, Bruce? Doing well. Eager to talk to you. Yes. It's when, Maybe uh, even at you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the internet is quite is quite amazing. It allows us to do these things. And I am talking to Bruce because of many things. First of all, he's a, an incredible scientist and amazing uh, knowledge about the field. It's, it's past, present, and maybe even its future, having been involved with some of the greatest experiments of all time, including perhaps, you know, one of the first or second experiments to really go after the detection of the CMB and its properties. And Bruce was involved with uh, with uh, my grand advisor. So my grand advisor was David Wilkinson. And he advised Peter Timby, and I'm still... Peter Timby is soon to be hopefully uh, collaborating closely with us in the Simons Projects as well. So as I talked to you earlier in the week, we always love to do a segment on this podcast that represents something you're not allowed to do, you're not supposed to do, which is to judge a book by its cover. And you have two wonderful books, um, one of which I read 30 years ago, which is called 3K. So I've always been eager to ask you how you came up with the title um, and the cover design because it depicts the Horsehead Nebula, which to my knowledge has nothing to do with the three Kelvin background, but maybe it does. So Bruce. The clever title, 3K was mine. I figured it was a nice abbreviation. The damn cover was designed by Cambridge University Press. It's part of a series, and they all show the Horsehead Nebula, which you're right, has nothing to do with the microwave background at all. I was thinking we could talk about the nebulae just for a minute in that it's often said that, I think it was McKellar, had detected properties of cyanide uh, in the interstellar medium, uh, and that supposedly that was, um, you know, revelatory of a three Kelvin background. What do you make of that? Did you know about those measurements? What, what do you think about those measurements in the early days, 1940? The situation is the following. These little cyanogen molecules, CN, that float around in space, but they appear to be excited as though they were bathed in a roughly three Kelvin field of radiation. They're not at zero temperature. They're at three Kelvin, three degrees above absolute zero, or roughly five degrees Fahrenheit above absolute zero. This is written down back in the 30s and 40s, and it was described by the discoverer as a being of some interest. But George Field, among other people, remembered reading that paper. And then when Penzias and Wilson found the three Kelvin radiation, he, he recognized that that three, K, three Kelvin radiation might be responsible for the excitation of cyanogen. And that gave us a measurement at a particular wavelength of 2.6 millimeters. It wasn't very precise, but it sure helped establish the cosmic nature of the radiation that Penzias and Wilson found. That's right. Now, I look at a lot of your research, and you have, um, you have an H index. I think it's the, um, you know, the cube of mine or something like that, or number of papers and citations that number close to 100,000, which is which is just astounding. And I, I've gone through many of them because they're all treasures and little diamonds and they're not so rough. Many of them are incredibly readable. But I want to ask you about, when I think of the Bruce Partridge brand, I think very high quality theory, but always attached and never divorced from experiments from the very beginning. Can you talk about your philosophy as, as, as a scientist to 
couple together theory and experiment is very hard to do, but you managed to do it. Can you give us tips to mortals like me? How, how did you manage to cultivate that? Is that an intention by intentionality? Experiments like Planck, ACT, now the Simons Observatory. What is that philosophy that's this guided? In, in terms of the theory side, I was interested in a field that was interesting, but fairly simple. And if you go back to the 60s, cosmology was simple. Uh, we, we didn't know anything, so it was a very simple subject to get into. And that extended also to my abilities and interest in, in the experimental side. When I showed up at Princeton as a postdoc, there were two experiments going on. One was the most famous one, namely looking at the microwave background and trying to establish that it was cosmic. And the other was measuring the shape of the sun, because Bob Dickey had a theory that would call on the sun to be somewhat oblate, squished in its, in its properties. So I went down to look at the solar oblateness experiment, a whole room full of electronics. Nah, too complicated. I went to look at the microwave background. There was a horn, went into waveguide. I knew about waveguides, went into the detector. I knew about detectors, so I signed up for that. So it was this sort of search for simplicity and stuff that I thought I could do. And those early experiments, uh, when, when reputed, what, what year did you arrive at, at Princeton as a, as a 65? It was right around the time of the... Three months after the paper was published that, that established the microwave background. So it was, it was early days. Now I've read that paper, you know, many times. Not, not, and, and the companion paper. I always call the Penzias and Wilson paper the companion paper because the companion, the Penzias and Wilson paper is only, I think, it's less than a full co page in the App J. It's it's, it's very, very short. I mean, they they were being very careful. They said, "Yeah, we found this signal. It's as though everywhere we look, we're looking at a surface of three degrees above absolute zero, not zero, but three degrees above, and." They didn't interpret it. The, the crucial moment, as you just pointed out, was the interpretation that this is the heat, cool down heat left over from the Big Bang. And that was in the Dickey Peeble role in Wilkinson paper that you probably have heard a million times as I have. That one is incredible. And in, um, in many times when I read it, I point out it, it doesn't, nowhere do the words Big Bang appear, but instead the the collapse from a previous epoch appears almost as if they kind of thought that it might be more likely that there there was a obviously formation of the nuclei, but they didn't necessarily believe that it was the origin of time or perhaps something like that. Take us back to those uh, to that year, that magical year in cosmology. We're coming up on the what sixtieth anniversary. I can't believe it. Close, close to yeah. And yeah. So tell me, what was that year, roughly speaking? What was going on in the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times back then? So going back to the 60s, there were basically two competing theories. Other speakers in this series may have mentioned that, but one was steady state in which the universe was always the same, everywhere the same and always the same. And in order to keep the density the same, sort of pop electrons and protons up out of nothing. And competing with that was the Big Bang Theory, uh, the universe had a finite beginning. Uh, it just started. And the suggestion was, most proponents of the Big Bang Theory accepted this, it would also be a hot Big Bang. So those two things were in the air. And Dickey and his colleagues were, in a sense, trying to push them together a little bit by imagining an infinite universe in time that simply cycled. It expanded, then it contracted, then it expanded, then it contracted. And that universe had to be hot for the following reason. In any one of these phases of the universe, stars make heavy elements. And after many cycles, you'd have nothing left but heavy elements. The universe would consist of nothing but iron and nickel. And it doesn't. So to get rid of the heavy elements, you have to have a hot Big Bang, which boils them away, turns them back into their constituent neutrons and protons. So there's a built-in you had to have heat in this model. And what's interesting was that the Princeton guys were actually setting out to find this. They had built a piece of equipment specifically designed to look for heat left over from the Big Bang when the fateful telephone call came from these two guys. Excuse me, I'm just going to be informal. Hold up a picture here. Of course, here. no. There they are. These are the two guys, Penzias and Wilson, uh, and behind them, the horn 
radio telescope that first noticeably detected the radiation. So they got in touch with the Princeton group, and the story, repeated in your book, Brian, is that Dickie was meeting with his young colleagues. This is before, just before I got there. Put his hand over the phone and said, well, boys, we've been scooped. Benjamin and Wilson had found a signal uh, that looked like it might be heat left over from the Big Bang, as Dickey and company were predicting. Important is that the Princeton experiment was specifically designed to look for this heat. So very quickly, within a year, it had produced better results than Penzias and Wilson and consistent with the original discovery. But again, Brian, as you point out in your book, the Nobel Prize went to Penzias and Wilson and not to Dickey and Wilson, Wilkinson and Peebles. Well, Peebles got his later, but... Yeah, <laughs> that's right, recently. And uh, Peebles, of course, is the co-author on one of your early papers. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I've always found the saddest story... Uh, the saddest person in the whole affair was this guy, Ed Ohm. Oh, I, I don't know much about him, but uh, but other than that, he used the very same horn antenna at Holmdel, which is a National Historic Landmark, um, and also uh, did uh, several of the same types of experiments that use similar types of radiometers. But the one thing he was missing was a was an internal calibrator that could check at rapid rates to get rid of the 1 over F signal. And of course, we know that by the name of your advisor uh, as a Dickey switch. And so they employed that. So the Dickey switch really is the thing that, but Ed Ohm is not blameless in this whole affair, because if you go over his technical report in the Bell Labs Telephone Systems Journal, which I read many times, many years ago, he does a, a thorough error analysis and then there's a three Kelvin term, <laughs> and he accounts that to the to the atmosphere, to the antenna temperature. It's really not clear to me. And I think Novikov and others later point also saw that term even before Penzias and Wilson. So they're kind of a lesson that I teach to my undergraduates that error analysis seems annoying, but it's very important you get it right, and that you account for all those errors. And that's that's one of the things that Penzias and Wilson did very very well. They saw the signal. They didn't say, we've seen a signal, I'm going to publish it in the Astrophysical Journal. They busted their butts trying to show that it was not radio stations from New York or pigeon poop in that horn, which would also radiate and cause a signal. They, they were very careful. Ohm, I think, didn't make those same steps. And the Russians, who read Ohm's paper, unlike the Princeton group, made the mistake of assuming that what Ohm was seeing was the atmosphere, where it wasn't, it was an addition to the atmosphere. So, 1930s, cyanogens floating around in space, kept warm by something, nobody paid any attention. Ohm, uh, Jasper Wall, did a radio astronomy experiment in which, looking at the spectrum of emission from our galaxy, seemed to show that there was a sort of additional term that he couldn't explain, equal to 5 Kelvin. So there were hints, and I, I like to make the point that what changed from hints and so on to a prediction was that paper by, by the Princeton group. They went out on a limb and said, this stuff is cosmic in origin. And then the next couple of years, Dave and I and other people worked to try to pin that down by doing two tests, if I may go on for a moment. The first was the spectrum, that is, if there's heat left over from the Big Bang, you should get the same temperature, 3 Kelvin or whatever, at every single wavelength you measure. And we set up a series of experiments that proved that you did and incidentally got a better value for the temperature. It's now 2.7 and it's closer. And the other is that if, if this stuff is left over from the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the universe is everywhere around you in any direction in which you look out you're seeing back in time. So this radiation, if it's cosmic in origin, ought to be isotropic. That is the same in all directions. Penzias and Wilson had checked to see that it wasn't coming from New York City or Philadelphia or the center of our galaxy, but the limits they set on it, isotropy, whether it's the same in all directions, were pretty poor. 
And Dave and I recognize that with fairly simple equipment, we could improve it by a couple of orders of magnitude, and we did. Houston, we have a problem. YouTube analytics tells me that only 15% of you are actually subscribed to my channel. Your subscription means a lot. It lets me know that you're enjoying the content and keeps you in the loop with the latest episodes and updates. Plus, it's a win-win. You supporting me helps me support you by getting best possible guests in the known universe. So hit that subscribe button. Now, back to my chat with Bruce. And one piece of advice I'd love to get, we have a lot of young listeners, PhD students, even graduate students. Uh, I've been working in the field of CMB B-mode polarization for you know 25 years almost by now. And we have yet to see, we, we, well, we saw a signal in 2014, but of course we had to recant that signal now, uh, or the interpretation of it. Still accurately measured, highly accurate, and dominated by astrophysical, not man-made or earthbound systematic. So it's an incredible accomplishment, still is the most sensitive measurement. How did you go through the years? So this is partially a question from one of your former students by the name of Professor Stefan Alexander. And I asked him for a question for you today, and he asked me, Essentially, how did you have the the sort of courage or, or how did you have the patience to do the first sorts of anisotropy measurements as you did to see if it was isotropic and not really see fruition until David Wilkinson and, and George Schmood and, and, and others um, measured the anisotropy convincingly? I, I would say the spectrum was known by you to be very close and others uh, to black body, or, or it was very easy. But the anisotropy was completely in upper limits after upper limits for almost 30 years. How did you have the courage and patience to deal with that? Give me advice to kind of uh, keep patient. This has been longer since the uh, between the detection of the CMB and its first anisotropy than it has been from its first anisotropy to measuring B-mode polarization. How can I have patience or what can you advise my students and I to do in terms of coping with decade after decade, perhaps of upper limits. When do we give up? Don't. This is, this is the one word advice. But remember, it, back in the 60s and even into the 70s, the idea was not to find anisotropies because, frankly, we weren't listening to the theorists and didn't really understand how rich the, the, the field of anisotropies could be. Instead, it was a different aim, and that is to show that the radiation was, in fact, isotropic. It's easy to imagine, let's say, starlight being thermalized by dust and emitting at the three Kelvin level. It's easy to imagine. Indeed, it was suggested by many people. But that would tend to be brighter towards the plane of the galaxy than perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. So our aim was not initially to find anisotropies, but not to find them, to set better and better upper limits. And... If I can hold up another thing here, uh, here's a plot. This is, again, this is rather informal, but a, a plot of measurements of temperature. And you notice the scale over here is in thousands of the Kelvin. Yeah. And this, this was a very crude experiment with lousy Dickey switching, which we set up first on, on a tall building at the Princeton University campus, and then realizing that New Jersey weather is not ideal. We took it out to Arizona and ran it. It was run remotely for a couple of years. Uh, the, the, the Arizona location involves some interesting stories. Dave Wilkinson discovered that Yuma, Arizona is the sunniest place in the United States. I discovered through my military father that there was an army base there. That's right. Proving ground. The Yuma proving ground and further research showed that there was a very secure area where we could put this piece of equipment about the size of a small hut out in the desert and not have it bothered. And it was secure because the Army was busy testing nerve gas shells. The idea was you build big wooden racks, put a bunch of nerve gas shells in, and wait to see if they leak. Needless to say, that area was fenced and patrolled. So I, I shouldn't feel bad about sending my graduate students, you know, to Chile for three weeks where there are active minefields. <laughs> we were issued gas masks, and we were told that there were certain physiological signs. And if you notice those, it was probably too late to put on the gas mask. So instead, the monitoring system was rabbits. I promised you to talk about the rabbits. Yes. So the rabbits were 
stationed in hutches around these nerve gas shells. And the idea was if it started, the nerve gas started to leak, the rabbits would die. Well, about halfway through our time there, the rabbits started to die. So there was a big fuss, all kinds of tests. We weren't allowed in for a while, got quite complicated. And it eventually turned out that the nerve gas wasn't leaking, but the army in its wisdom had bought three dozen rabbits, all of the same age. <laughs> so we happened to, to have been there at the time when the rabbits reached three score and 10 years and were beginning to crawl. <laughs> Of natural <laughs> anyway. well, well, what we were able to show is there's some scatter back and forth, but there are no excursions that are bigger than about a third of a percent of the microwave background. So no evidence that the radiation was coming from a particular place. Strong support for the cosmic interpretation by 1968 or so. And the original paper, Nipedzis and Wilson, and subsequent ones by, by you guys at, at Princeton, the topic of polarization was broached, actually, as early as uh, 1967. Well, in 65, Penzies and Wilson set a limit of 10% or unpolarized, a little below 10%. And then in 1967, I believe it was, uh, Martin Rees, Lord Martin Rees now is a three-time guest on this podcast, he came out with a paper uh, that suggested the CMB could be polarized. And in fact, it could be highly polarized. And that was based on the model that the, uh, that the Big Bang or the Hubble expansion could be anisotropic. It could have an, you know, an anisotropy to it that would generate a quadrupole moment in the photons. So it'd be a huge quadrupole moment in the CMB's anisotropy, and that would generate a large amount of polarization. And I like to point out when I, when I talk to him that you know he was right, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, but that that actually has a lot in common with a lot of what science is about. Uh, for example, Galileo believed that the Earth orbited around the Sun. We know that's true, but he used the tidal pattern of the Earth's tides as a piece of evidence for sloshing and swirling of tides, and it has nothing to do with that. So, can you comment on? You know how sometimes incorrect theories can generate useful scientific tests and sometimes detections. And obviously, I'm going to pivot to inflation and dark matter and string theory in just a bit. But talk about how how much should an experimentalist listen to a theorist? <laughs> My first answer would be, in this field at least, not enough. And I'll come back to that. But first, let me talk about the polarization business. The detector that Dave Wilkins and I used was intrinsically polarized. So had there been a huge signal in polarization, we would have seen it. In addition, in Reese's paper, in order to make a big polarized signal, not, not a tiny one, you have to have an anisotropic universe. And that would have resulted in a sort of dipole, potato-shaped, sausage-shaped temperature distribution in the sky, which we didn't see. The polarization that we do see now is from a much subtler effect. There is a small quadrupole moment, which we do expect, and that produces the roughly tenth of a percent type polarization that we detect in the microwave background. I said earlier that we should have listened to the theorists a little bit more. Because so many of the early people in this field came out of Bob Dickey's group, and Bob Dickey was an absolute master at null experiments, showing that such and such was smaller than a certain value. The time rate of change of the gravitational constant was below one part in 10 to the 12, and so on and so forth. A lot of our experiments were designed to be null experiments, and we weren't particularly interested in finding something, and we didn't particularly pay attention to the theorists who were telling us, if you're looking for small variations in the temperature, you ought to be looking on scales of the order of a degree or below. And that's reflected in the design of the COBE satellite, which you know about, the experiment that won George Smoot his Nobel Prize was consciously designed to look for small changes in temperature in different parts of the sky, but at the wrong scale, a 10-degree scale instead of 1-degree scale. We could have done much better, might even have found the anisotropies earlier had the experiment been designed better and had George and the rest of us listen to the theorists. We were busy trying to 
get lower and lower limits. Yes, it's natural uh, to do that. I guess the question you know that comes up all the time with me, and and there seems to be obviously there is groupthink in any organization of individuals, just because they have uh, incentives to maybe um, you know combine or, or or be be related to those in their field that are setting the trends and so forth. So nowadays. Uh, you see a lot of more string theorists than people looking at things like uh, loop quantum gravity or some other alternative that could be plausible. So too, I worry that there are an awful lot of people invested in inflation. And I wonder, are there parallels that you see as an observer both then and now between the dominance of a theoretical paradigm and the um, cultural pressure for young people to go into that field, either as experimentalists in my case, or as theorist in, in, in others' cases. I don't buy the argument about the social pressure. You, you, there's a sort of standard view. Yeah, inflation is important. And of course, it is consistent with a lot of things we're finding, including isotropy. But when I read of a, a new experimental result, my very first reaction is, how can I show this is wrong? Can I do a simple experiment to show that it's wrong? I'll give you an example. I was sent a paper to review, which claimed that because of some complicated theory, there had to be a strong anisotropy in the gamma ray background. So I did the calculation and discovered that if I simply held up a plate full of raw eggs, the gamma rays that this guy was predicting would be present, would cook it instantly. I think a lot of us have that sort of skeptical, how can I show this is wrong attitude and are not terribly hidebound by the sort of prevailing orthodoxy, let's call it. And you look at your advisor, Dickey, I don't think he gets enough credit for comp you know, the contributions. First of all, he was an exemplar of, uh, of what I think of as the paradigm of a physicist, like uh, a Fermi or a Galileo, in that he knew the theory and he could do experiments too. And that's extremely rare. Uh, um, we'll talk about later your philosophy on pedagogy. But one of the things that Dickey contributed to the theory of inflation was, I think he pointed out, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, to a young Alan Guth, that there was this, you know, kind of cosmic coincidence of the flatness of the universe, not knowing that it was exactly flat, but knowing, knowing it was within an order of magnitude of being flat. Can you talk about that, that kind of, um, those notions and why it wouldn't be inflation that I would first think to sort of want to explain. It would be probably the missing you know, baryons or missing matter. What what made that stand out so much to, to your advisor, to Bob Dickey? If you can speculate, obviously he's not here anymore. I, I will have to speculate, but it, it's the following. Take two parts of the universe that are very far apart. Suppose one part of the universe wants to tell another part of the universe what to do. For instance, point A wants to tell point B what temperature to be. That information can't travel faster than the speed of light. So, on very large scales, there's no way that one part of the universe knew to be 3 Kelvin and another part of the universe knew to be 3 Kelvin, unless it was an initial condition. And you don't like initial conditions. You don't like to have to say, well, the universe started out in just such a way that it's now three degrees Kelvin. So how do you explain that? And that worried Dickey. He was worried about that. He was worried about Mach's principle and some other things that have to do with these large-scale properties and puzzles in the universe. And what Alan Goose and company did was basically to explain it. And that is to say that at some earlier time, the universe was so small that regions that are now too far apart to talk to each other were perfectly happy in confabulation early on. And then the universe expanded exponentially, which we call inflation. So the fact that the, um, back to this picture, which I keep showing. Yeah. Got, <laughs> this, this picture shows you that the universe is pretty much the same in all directions. Well, how did it know on a large scale would be the same in all directions? It had to be in contact, causal contact, to use a technical word, at some early time. And that's that's what's behind inflation, is to get that done. Going back to the same year, in 1967, I pulled up a, a paper, which is still getting citations, uh, from uh, a young Bruce Partridge and uh, young uh, Jim Peebles. 
and it's called Are Young Galaxies Visible? And you talk about the purpose of this paper is to assess the general population possibility of observing distant newly formed galaxies. To this end, a simple model of galaxy formation is introduced, and you talk about star forming and their luminosity, and then you say they, these bright phases would correspond to an epoch of a few uh, tens or hundreds of millions of years, corresponding to a redshift between 10 and 30. I want to talk about recent um, so-called claims or discoveries or controversies, as our British friends might say, regarding the seeming observation of very mature galaxies at very high redshift, much higher than than ever anticipated. And for this, I, I am old enough that I can actually remember the controversies that similarly seem to erupt after the Hubble Deep Field was released in 95 or so. And that was in the middle of my graduate student career, beginning of it. So I want to ask you, what do you make of these of these findings and controversies? I mean, are they just not reading your paper? This paper that you wrote, in other words, these scientists are saying that the universe must be much older than we previously thought, possibly even eternal, uh, because the galaxies that we see are two highly organized grand designs and spirals and so forth. You showed almost, again, 60 years ago, <laughs> 54 years ago, that this was possible. What's going on here? Okay, well, this goes back to the previous discussion where we talk about a sort of orthodoxy. The orthodoxy these days on galaxy formation, it's probably correct, but let's question it, is that galaxies are built up by mergers of little things. So you start with a bunch of little things, they merge together, that blob merges with another blob, and pretty soon you've got a galaxy. The problem is that you've got to do that really, really fast to explain mature galaxies very early in the history of the universe. The approach that Peebles and I took was very different, and that is a blob of gas of galactic mass collapsed in on itself and started to form stars. So you went from nothing, or relatively smoothly distributed gas, to a galaxy, not by merger. Maybe there was some something in that after all. Maybe that's how these mature systems do form. It's always interested me that the way you find that a galaxy is at large redshift and is star forming is to look for a sharp discontinuity in the spectrum introduced by the Lyman, Lyman break, which is in that paper. What may be going on is that galaxies form in special places, more like the partridge Peebles model, but not universally, and that mergers are responsible for most galaxies, but not the ones that the web is finding, or that these galaxies look bigger and more massive than they actually are. And th that is a possibility. But it is sort of fun to argue with the, with the conventional orthodoxy because if you start with things that are, let's say, a million times the mass of the sun, and you merge two of them, you get something that's two million times the mass of the sun. And then you have to merge again and get something that's four million times the mass of the sun, and then eight million. And how the hell do you get something that is mm, pushing a billion times the mass of the sun in the time that's allowed? You're... Uh... Have more on the iconoclastic or maverick side of things, which is yeah, which is, yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, which is which is fun to do, but it's it's tough to. First of all, you have to have the prerequisites to get to that level, and I feel like these guys that are criticizing or saying the Big Bang never happened, like uh, Eric Lerner and even um, Raj Rajendesh Gupta at University of Ottawa, you know, published the universe is twenty six billion years old. Um, they all sort of rely on, on, you know, kind of a series of just so stories, but they can always point to flaws in the in the Big Bang, in especially in the early universe cosmology, because every model will have its lacunae. And I think, obviously, you know, the Big Bang does too. I would say of all the ones that are pointed out by Lerner and Gupta and others, uh, the one that still is sort of in question that I'd like to get your take on, although, you know, I don't think this has been a field of study for you, but it's the lithium abundance problem, that there seems to be the largest gap between predicted abundances in the BBN, um, you know, kind of taxonomy and observed. Uh, the biggest one extant is in lithium. Can you talk about that? Is that something we, we should be concerned about? Or is this just messy nuclear physics that 
the guys that operate, you know, giant Van de Graaffs will someday figure out. What what do you make of the lithium problem as this proves the Big Bang never happened? I think it's a very weak read in which on which to claim that you've disproven the Big Bang. Just to set some context, the early universe starts out, it's it's hydrogen, neutrons, a little bit of helium, and a tiny, tiny amount of lithium is produced as a sort of byproduct. But lithium is a fragile nucleus. It can be made in cosmic ray interactions. So it, it's not all that convincing as a, as a proof or disproof of the Big Bang. The deuterium abundance, on the other hand, is very important. And what's interesting to me is that nuclear physicists, uh, guided by people like Jim Peebles and Bob Wagoner, were predicting how much deuterium and how much helium should emerge from the Big Bang, and we discover exactly that amount. And the amount of deuterium is consistent with a very small amount of ordinary matter in the universe, which the microwave background also emphasizes. So lithium is sort of, a, to me, a side issue. It can be made, it can be destroyed in stars, so it's, it's a little, again, just a weak read on which to undermine so much other observational evidence. On your website, which we'll link to in the video description below, you um, have a nice discussion of you know the research interests that you have had and maintained, and it concludes with one statement that careful measurements of these CMB fluctuations, both from space and the ground, have turned cosmology into a precision science. I had uh, Mike Turner on, who I know you know, and he said, uh, not about you, but he's he's famous for saying, you know, precision cosmology is nice, but accurate cosmology is better. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if you can um, talk about, are there things that st are still outstanding, maybe not mysteries, but there's further research in areas of the CMB that might be considered to have been a closed book? And I'm thinking about distortions. I'm talking about Compton Y. I'm talking about... Uh, chemical potentials. Are there still things of interest that a young student might be able to contribute to in that particular field? Yes, I think so, both in terms of spectral distortions, which is what you're mentioning. But to me, much, much more interesting in a sense is, is pushing harder and harder and harder on the visible anisotropies. If I can just scoot aside for a while, here's, here's a map of the sky. Uh, and these regions of red and blue are slightly higher and slightly cooler regions of the microwave background. Studying those has proven to be an absolute bonanza in terms of refining cosmological theories. As an instance, if you look at that picture carefully, you'll see that there's quite a lot of structure at roughly the one degree scale. Yeah. Less at two degrees and less at half a degree. Well, why should that be? Well, it turns out that that is exactly what you expect from the size of the universe at the time we're mapping it, provided the universe has a flat spatial curvature and not otherwise. So simply finding where the peak is in terms of the distribution of fluctuations tells you about the curvature of the universe. You've already mentioned the B modes. We're looking for those. At the small scale end, the way structure forms in the universe can distort the microwave background fluctuations a little bit, not much. Mm -hmm. But because the measurements are now so good, uh, we can put constraints on things like the speed at which gravity pulls matter together to make galaxies and so on. And there are, fortunately for young people in the field, still some, some interesting tensions. Um, you've probably talked about this before, but... If you ask how fast the universe is expanding, if you'd asked that question in 1960, you'd get two answers from two warring groups, one claiming it was expanding twice as fast as the other. It got to the point where if you ever had a meeting dealing with cosmology, you had to invite one person from each group where they'd get PO'd. Now, the debate is between the supernova guys who are claiming uh, a number that's about 10% different from the number that Brian and the CMB folks are claiming. I don't think we're at the point where you have to have one from each school at each cosmology meeting, but there's a real tension there. The difference between 
67 in the standard units and 73 in the standard units is three or four times the error. So something isn't right somewhere, and that needs to be sorted out. And the rate of growth of structure, how fast gravity pulls things together, is also somewhat in dispute. Mm -hmm. Remark to Brian, this is the S8, or Sigma 8, top of the So there's still work to be done. Yeah, and I see that as yeah, yet one of many tensions. And I, I just had the opportunity to to uh, visit my alma mater, uh, which is Case Western, last week, and I met with um, a friend of mine who wasn't a professor until a couple of years after I graduated, and that was Glenn Starkman. And uh, he is is making a very convincing case that based on that image behind you that you helped to make, I believe that's from Planck. Um, and you were a, a W map, I think. But oh, that's W map. Okay. Well, the Planck, Planck did the very, very upgraded and beautiful um, and, and complimentary and also in, in strong agreement with the W map map. So there's Planck. Yeah. That's good. Beautiful. Okay. I'm, I'm partial to W map because it has my grand advisor's name as the first. And I'm sure your friend, David Wilkinson, is uh, nice to be uh, located in L2. I pointed out he'll probably be orbiting the universe uh, forever, his namesake instrument. Uh, but Glenn has pointed out that if you take that image behind you and you put it, that's in galactic coordinates, I assume. But if you kind of rotate it 45 degrees, it turns out it's in ecliptic coordinates. And he says that if you take uh, and you make a power spectrum, of uh, our correlation function, not a power spectrum, but of the uh, data in the northern ecliptic hemisphere and you compare it to the southern ecliptic hemisphere. And this was pointed out by our good friend, David Spurgle, back in 2003 from those data behind you. So I know that for a fact that there's an asymmetry. There's a big asymmetry between the statistical properties of the north and south hemisphere. Barely visible here, but this is, looks a little redder than up there. That's exactly right. And there are things like the cold spot. Interestingly enough, the axis of evil, so-called, we'll talk about that in just a second, but the cold spot is in the southern hem ecliptic hemisphere, and that seems to agree with what you'd get from a Gaussian random simulation based on lambda CDM. But the north isn't. The north you only get in, if you account for everything, I think with the latest Planck data, uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn's student uh, Joanne was showing me this last week, there's only a 0.02% chance it arises at random. If you've been around this a long time, what do you make of these kind of uh, these asymmetries? Are we trying to demand too much of this big bang bonanza that is the CMB? Is it really fair to, ac to ask for it to be accurate and precise at the two hundredths of a percent level? That may be pushing it. Um... And again, as, as you well know, the sort of standard explanation for the hot spots and the hemispheric asymmetry is basically goes back to playing poker. Any given hand that you're dealt is highly unlikely. I mean, it, not just a royal straight flush, but you know, a two of spades, a three of clubs, blah blah blah. Any particular thing is unlikely, but it has to be something. Yeah, and so some of that point. 0.2% is covered by cosmic variance. Just the universe happens to be that way. So it doesn't keep me up at night. Mm. Well, I would love to see someone actually improve the measurements or figure out how to beat cosmic variance to see if there's something that's statistically odd about the microwave background at large scales. It's again, I'm like kind of classic, but not losing sleep over that. <laughs> Unlike losing sleep over... The, the rate of expansion of the universe and the growth of structure. Those worry me. Are there other explanations that you prefer for, say, explaining the Hubble tension? I'm quite partial, and I want to explain my reasoning because I'd love to get your opinion as one of the heroes and, and legends in the field. But my, my philosophy of experiments and even theories is that you should always do very extremely risky science on the one hand, with one of your hands, but on the other hand, you should do something that's known to exist and known to be there such that the whole thing is not an empty uh, pursuit. I always laughed when my colleagues in high energy physics down the hall would say the most exciting thing we could discover with the Large Hadron Collider is nothing. And I would say, yes, and then you will discover unemployment. But uh, so it was a big gamble, but it was also safe on the other hand that we sort of had a good idea. I, I like to do searching for uh, the the cosmic microwave backgrounds B modes 
because uh, they may be there. It's extremely high risk science. They may not be there, even if inflation took place. And then on the other hand, I like to do very low risk stuff. And one of the topics that you've worked a lot on when you were uh, with the ACT uh, team folks, and you still are contributing member to many of their papers, is look for the mass of neutrinos. I want to ask you, sorry to keep saying, I, I was going to say as a legend, I'm going to keep stop saying that. I'm going to say as someone who's been in the field for a long time. I'm not yet. As an observer of this field for a very long time. Let's say we are successful. We meaning us on the Simons Observatory, and we measure the mass of cosmic neutrinos for the first time ever. We have lower limit. We have an upper limit. We don't have a detection. Will our colleagues in high energy physics department circles, will they believe us, Bruce, based on your knowledge of history and thought of the philosophy of this field? I think, frankly, it's touch and go unless it's a really clear measurement. Going back in the history, one of the things that you can use both cosmic nuclear synthesis, so the formation of helium and deuterium in the early universe, to tell you, is the number of neutrino species. And it was not clear whether that was three or four or five back, let's say, in the, in the early 70s. Dave Schramm and others interpreted the astrophysical data, data and said, no, it's got to be three. Yeah, it wasn't clear that anybody believed that. We now know that it's 3.05, roughly speaking. So it's not four, it's not five. A little bit later, I used the astrophysical data, just pure CMB and some other stuff, to point out that, that the lab measurement of the lifetime of the free neutron was not right. Didn't, didn't agree with the astrophysical data. To say that was a stone that sank without a ripple would be an understatement. But later, the lab experiment showed that I was right and so on. So it, it, it takes a lot of effort. If we publish, a let's say, a three sigma measurement that the neutrino mass is 0 0.057 plus or minus 0 0.002, whatever, will people get up in arms about it and, and try to improve the lab experiments to, to justify this or to confirm it? I, I, I don't know. There are people like Mike Turner who work, and many others, who work at the interface between cosmology and particle physics, who I think would take it seriously. But whether your colleagues down the hall who are big accelerator guys will, I, d I don't know. I hope we do the experiment. That is, I hope we come up with this number and publish it and say, there it is, guys. Bruce, before I have to go and teach myself, I want to ask you about pedagogy. Um, you are one of the best educators uh, not just a cosmology, but but you're you're dedicated your life um, uh, at a predominantly undergraduate uh, well, at an undergraduate serving institution that's had a, a host of eminent scientists come out of it out of your classes, and you have you know, sort of revolutionized and enhanced the teaching of cosmology at the undergraduate level. I want to ask you about your theory of pedagogy, and in the following uh, sense, I teach a lot of undergraduates. And I teach gra uh, graduate students experimentalists. I've had a few theoretical, you know, graduate graduate students who are only doing theory, not experiment. What is the theoretical minimum, or shall I say, the experimental minimum? What should an experiment, a theoretical graduate student, know about experimental physics or experiment? Let's just stick to cosmology. What should he or she know? She's starting off. She's really excited to come up with an explanation for the hemispherical asymmetry, the uh, some sterile neutrino signature in the CMB, a large extra dimension. But what should she know about experimental astrophysics before she goes and does everything she's going to do in theory? I would say that the main lesson to take away, and I harp on this when I talk to, to theorists, is just how damn difficult these experiments are. They're not easy. You have a big piece of equipment the size of your lab or bigger, sitting at a temperature of 300 Kelvin, and you're trying to make measurements of the order of 10 micro Kelvin with that piece of equipment. It's not easy, guys. Given that, theorists pay real attention to the issue of systematics and instrumental effects. Don't leave that to the, to the instrumentalists. Think about it yourself. If I see a signal, suppose I suddenly discover a hemispheric asymmetry. Are you really sure that doesn't have to do with the way your instrument is designed and the fact that it happens to be in the southern hemisphere and not the northern? It, 
may be that the answer is okay, but think about it. That's what I would tell theorists. We always end with a, a comment from the guest on a quote from Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who is the namesake of the foundation that endowed the center that I am uh, affiliated with here in San Diego, the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And Arthur, good old Arthur, I don't know if you ever knew him or met him. I didn't. I've read his books. Yeah. So he had uh, many, many quips and sayings, one of which is the only way to know the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And that's the origin of the name of this podcast. Another one that I like to use on my colleagues who think of too highly of themselves is he used to say, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. But the question I want you to comment on uh, is the following. He said, when a distinguished older scientist says something is possible, he or she is very likely to be right. But when he or she says something is impossible, they are very much likely to be wrong. But I want to ask you, not if you, you know, um, if you agree, but rather, what have you changed your mind on in this field of cosmology? As our final question, have you been wrong or have you changed your mind about something that you held very firmly in your youth and, and yet change came to your mind? The business of galaxy formation. We had, Jim and I had a particular model in mind and most people don't believe that, so I've been sort of forced to change my mind, although I haven't really given up on it. The other is dark matter. When, when people started talking about dark matter, it seemed to be absolutely and totally ridiculous. Stuff that we know nothing about somehow is important in the universe. And I simply refuse to believe that, despite all the good work of Vera Rubin and, and people like that, showing that it probably there is something out there. And what finally got me to believe to believe in it was a the, Bibulous conversation with Jerry Ostreicher, right? drinking beer on a boat in Lake Ontario. And he said, Bruce, God damn it, if, if you don't see fluctuations at a level of at least 10 to the minus 3 in the microwave background, it's all over. Well, I'd already done an experiment showing the upper limit was less than that. So what was going on? Well, what's going on is that the fluctuations in the microwave background are produced by the baryons, and the gravity is mediated by the dark matter. So the dark matter can be happily gravitating away and not make the fluctuations that Ostreicher insisted we should be seeing. So in a sense, my own work came up behind me and kicked me in the butt. <laughs> Maybe that's a good place to end this. Right? Uh, well, uh, I want to thank you for many things, uh, not the least of which is inspiring me as a, as a young graduate student with that wonderful book, 3K, with that horrible cover. Uh, but uh, you made up for it with your book with Jim Peebles and Lyman Page, past guest on the podcast, uh, Finding the Big Bang. We'll put a link to those books in the show notes. And uh, Bruce, I just want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for being an exemplar of what a good cosmologist should be and being a mentor and through all your years of service, which we also didn't get to talk about, maybe we'll do this in person someday, a uh, part two. But Bruce, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. And let's join in thanking the Simons Foundation. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for watching this interview with Bruce. I hope you enjoyed it. I had so many great takeaways and memories from this episode. I know you will too. Now, on my YouTube channel, I try to give you as much content as possible, but there's so much more I want to share with you. That's why I'm urging you to subscribe and join my mailing list at briankeating.com. This is where I share the hottest news in science. You'll also enter a giveaway for a piece of 4 billion year old space dust, aka a meteorite. So if you have a .edu email address, you'll automatically win one. But anyway, you can enter to win one no matter what your email address is. Just go to briankeating.com. Sign up. Thanks again. See you on the other side.